So God bless you. It's, it's a really great privilege. I always consider it a privilege to be with women who want to study the word of God and not study themselves, but study the word of God and have the word of God reveal themselves because that's what the word of God does. The more that we study Christ and who he is, the word of God, the more I learn about this own heart of mine. And I know what God wants to do in this heart of mine. So let's just bow our heads and commit this time to the Lord and just ask for his blessing that he opens our hearts, that we hear what he wants us to hear. And God bless you tonight. Father God, we do just thank you for this time together, Lord. I thank you for each and every woman, Lord God, that is here, Lord God, and for the ones who are going to listen afterwards. And I ask you, Father, for your blessing upon this word. And Lord, just even for Lord, for the babies, I ask you to keep them settled, Lord, so that these ladies can concentrate and just be focused upon you tonight, Lord God. And Father, we commit this time to you now and ask, Father, Lord, I pray, Lord, that I would speak what you'd have me to speak, Lord, and no more and no less. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So I have a bit of a challenge for you here tonight first. It's a mental concentration challenge because I know that... Um, especially the mummies, you've been busy with the children and you, you've been putting them through the ropes, you've been doing some schooling with them and so on, but it's time for me now to put you through the ropes and to give you a little bit of a challenge here tonight. Um, so here's your challenge. You're going to listen to me read five scriptures. You're not going to turn to them. You're not going to read them with me, but you're going to listen to five scriptures and you're going to tell me at the end of those five scriptures what one word is common to all five verses. Okay, so it's a listening skill. It's a test of your concentration. I think it'll be um, uh, just good for the old brain juices. Okay, some of you've been working, working, and now today um, you're you're going to you're going to just put those listening ears on. Listen to the scripture and try to find one word that comes up in all five scriptures, okay? So we'll see at the end. Now I'm going to get you to, be, to, to do the typing, all right? So nobody type until I've finished all five scriptures. So welcome, Karen, if you can hear me. I'm going to read five scriptures and I want to know what one word is common to all five scriptures. Here we go. This is Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Here's your second scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 18. Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but thou shalt re well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. Here's your third scripture, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. Here's your fourth scripture. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 7. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until you came unto this place. You've been rebellious against the Lord. And here's your fifth and final scripture. Deuteronomy 15 and verse 15. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. So let's see on the chat who can come up with the one common word that comes up in those five scriptures. Are you in your marks? Get set. Go. I have to find the chat now. Where is it? Who's anybody? Put it. Anybody got the word? Anybody got the one word? Let's see. I'm waiting for that chat. Uh, where's the chat gone? <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, chat, right. Okay, let's see. Right. <laughs> very, some very intelligent answers. Okay. So the first person in with the right answer is Victoria. Then Christine. Then 
uh, very good. Angie, very good. Randa, very good. Mia, very good. Okay. So some clever answers there because um, Hannah gave me the answer Deuteronomy, which is very clever, of course. The one common word to all five scriptures is the word Deuteronomy and certainly the word Lord. Indeed. Well done there. Okay. So if you do not remember anything from tonight's short message, I ask you to remember this one word. Remember. Remember. That is our word for tonight. And what is it that God is asking us in these scriptures to remember? And perhaps more importantly, as women, why is he asking us to remember? Well, <clears throat> of all the books in the Bible, it's interesting that the word remember appears in these first five books of Moses the most. That's where they appear the most. In fact, this book of Deuteronomy is the book where 14 instances of the word remember is found. And there's a very good reason. Because the people of God we see were so prone to forget. So we've often spoken of these first five books of Moses and we know that four of them cover the historic record of the people of God coming out of Egypt, being freed from their bondage, from their slavery. And we know again that this is an historical account. It is history written down, recorded. And yet it is also in the word of God to remind us, to show us, to give us types and shadows of our own walk with Jesus Christ. So I don't think I need to explain in great detail that Israel coming out of Egypt is a beautiful picture of you and me, the ones who've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that these Israelites were under the bondage of Pharaoh, and they were slaves for years, just as I was a slave to sin, just as I was a slave to myself and to the passions of this wicked heart, and yet I was redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that the most wonderful news? We could stop right there and just stop praising the Lord because He is worthy when we think of what He has redeemed us from. Sisters in Christ, friends, it is it, that's this is this is an, a, a, an amazing record. This is a picture of our walk, our salvation. But do you know that not everybody believes? this account. In fact, very interestingly, the main Google search for this title or the subject, The Exodus, will bring you up to the very famous page called Wikipedia. And I want you to listen to what Wikipedia says about the Exodus. Now, not my words, Wikipedia's words. The Exodus is the charter myth of the Israelites. Let me just say that one short sentence again. The Exodus is the charter myth of the Israelites. Did you hear that word myth? A myth is something that cannot be verified. A myth is something which is made up, it's conjured up, it's imagined. Listen to what it carries on to say. Wikipedia says, this charter myth is spread over the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and it tells the myth of enslavement of the Israelites in ancient Egypt. It tells the myth of their liberation through the hand of their deity, Yahweh. And it tells the myth of the revelations at biblical Mount Sinai and their wanderings in the wilderness up to the borders of Canaan. Myth. But this is what the world says about actual events in history. But do you know, sisters, this is what the devil has done to blind the eyes with regards to actual history, but it's what the devil can do to us in our spiritual history. Interestingly, just in very recent years and in recent months, Gaza, which is the site of the great pyramids in Egypt, I'm sure all of you have seen pictures of the three great pyramids of Egypt. And in very recent months, and I'm talking just in the last couple of years, they have been doing some excavations around Gaza. And as they've been 
digging down and down as archaeologists do when they're searching for those artifacts that will reveal something about history, they've actually fenced off large areas which used to be open to the tourists. So I'm very jealous of Keith because he's been there. I, it's one place I would love to go to, just to Gaza, to Egypt, to see those great and amazing pyramids, which they, they still can't figure out how, quite, how they cut those stones so perfectly. But here's the interesting thing. Why have they fenced off those, those areas? Because they're finding more and more that archaeology is coming up all the time with just exactly what the Bible says. You know, just 20, 30 years ago, maybe, uh, maybe less, the archaeologists and historians said there, were, there was no such thing as the Hittite people. Then, of course, they started digging up all sorts of archaeological things to prove that there'd been a, an entire civilization of, of Hittite people and the kings and everything that was mentioned in the Bible that was absolutely true. <clears throat> Again, if we're not careful, the devil will fence off, ring fence those things that have happened in our past and cause us to be blinded and cause us to forget what Christ has done for us. Just like those archaeologists and historians are scared that they'll actually find something that lines up with the Bible and, and that actually proves that the Bible is factual. We know the Bible is factual. We know the Bible is an actual account. But this is what the devil will do. The devil will blind our eyes to the miraculous. Now, the reason I wanted to, talk, to highlight <clears throat> this remembering is because we find ourselves in this very unusual lockdown period, and we've been having the privilege of Wednesdays and Sundays listening to testimonies, testimonies of salvation, of the miraculous work uh, and deliverance of God in the lives of so many of you. Testimonies of salvation are remembering. It's a time when we can remember where we were, who we were, and how Christ brought us out. And can I say this? If we do not remember our individual miracles of deliverance from the power and the bondage of Egypt, we will be tempted to doubt God for our future. And sisters, one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight this to you tonight is because this has become very real to me, that if Christ is the deliverer and the savior of my soul, it is no greater miracle for him to heal, for him to deliver your loved ones, our loved ones in the future. Do you know what Israel did? Their first mistake was to undervalue the deliverance of God. The first mistake that we can make is to undervalue the deliverance that God has effected in our individual lives. If we lose sight of the power and the riches that it took to redeem my soul and your soul, we will distrust God so quickly and easily with our futures. Well, I would like to take just a little bit of time to look at Israel and what they did, how they behaved once they got into that wilderness after they had left Egypt. You will remember that as they come into that wilderness, one of the events that takes place is that Moses chooses one man from each tribe the 12 tribes of israel and says now go into the promised land and spy it out for us spy it out for us and i want to read this account to you you don't have to turn there but if you want to make a record the scripture is from the end of numbers chapter 13 and it goes just a little bit into numbers chapter 14. so numbers 13 and verse 32 says and they, that's the spies, brought an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, 
which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Numbers 14 carries on. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept at night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we died in the land of Egypt. Or would God that we died in this wilderness. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of Israel. So we can see Moses interceded for the people. And just one more verse in chapter 14 of Numbers, it says, only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Now, what this gives me a picture of, sisters, when, I, when we see these people seeing giants, don't for one minute think, that's just Israel. I would never have done that. I find in my own heart and if you're honest tonight, somewhere in your heart, I do believe you can find too, that these giants speak of a fear of the future. You see, that land is a picture of somewhere we are going. We are going to a promised land. This life is just very short, very quick. You know, I hope you all know by now, what, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last but you know i find that during this time even of lockdown we're wondering every day as time goes on as the phases come in as as the lockdown's phasing down we're asking ourselves how will things be how will things be for the children at school how will things be for us in the church how will things be for us meeting how will things be for, for going to to, to, to the meetings? How will things be for going into the city? How will things be for evangelizing, for, for me at work? How, how will I interact with people? Is it going to be more uh, of, a, of, a, of a nanny state, of a police state? How are things going to be for us? We do know that we do hear of tribulations coming for the people of God. We read about persecutions, we read about hardships, we read about famines and wars. All of these things are to happen before Christ returns. But sisters, I want to tell you tonight, do not see those as giants. Do not see those as giants. I ask you to have that spirit and heart of Caleb and Joshua who said, they're not giants. They're nothing. They're nothing. He has given us this land. It's a land of plenty. Do not fear. And Again, I want to express to you tonight that I'm not telling you this from a distant land myself. I'm there. I am crying out to the Lord and asking the Lord, give me no fear, whatever we have to go through. You know, one of my great hero heroes of the faith is Willie Burton. He was a missionary in the Congo. And I read an article about him, about him just recently <laughs> on the coming of Christ. And I love the picture he gave. And I want to share that with you tonight because as women, you can understand this. He compares the trials and the tribulations that we may face in the coming of Christ or the, as in the time toward the coming of Christ. He compares that time to a time when a mother is pregnant and expecting the delivery of a baby. Every mother knows, even the first time mother, and perhaps the first time mother with more dread, Dread, dread comes in knowing that there will be pain. There will be labor. There will be um, changes and, 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 and severe pain before that baby is actually in her arms. Yet, she does know that the sheer joy of holding that babe in her arms will far exceed any pain that she might bear during that childbirth or that birthing process. So <clears throat> we as believers in Christ can look forward with joy and we must look forward with joy. 
sheer joy to the coming of Christ. And yet, whatever tribulations or trials await us, we know that it will be worth it. It will be worth it. Let us never forget to look for the coming of Christ. Do you know, this word remember, which we're remembering tonight, is another name for the table of the Lord or the Lord's table on a Sunday. And that table is a place that we're told, remember, remember that he came. Remember that he died and shed his blood for you and me individually. Remember that he rose and remember that he's coming again. And he's coming again soon. If he has saved me from my past, if he has saved me from who I was, can he not save us in time to come? He has saved us. He is saving us and he will save us. His, our future is in his hands and his promise is for new mercies every morning. Let us remember not to be like the people of Israel who saw those giants and kept themselves out of that promised land for such a long, long time. Do you know one of the things that's always been astounding to me is how very, very quickly Israel forgot. I know we've spoken about this before many times in ladies' Bible studies, but listen to just this one scripture because we can calculate the actual number of days. In Exodus 16 and verse 1, it says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. The 15th day of the second month. Now, I looked up the length of the months in that Jewish calendar. And this amounts to around 45 days. Do you know that as of today, the 21st of May, 2020, we've been here in Ireland, it is, we've been in lockdown for 56 days. Now, maybe for some of you, that's been quite quick. Maybe for some of you, it's been quite slow. Certainly for me, it seems like it's gone back to buy in a flash and I'm almost not wanting it to end. It's gone by so quickly. This is the nature of our hearts we forget very quickly. Israel had been mightily, mightily delivered by the Lord God from Pharaoh and his army. That mighty deliverance at the Red Sea, forget all of those plagues and miracles that happened in the land of Egypt before they even left Egypt. And yet they had forgotten. They became discontent so quickly. You know, my favorite commentator on the Bible is Matthew Henry. And he says, discontent magnifies what is past, vilifies what is present without regard to truth or reason. Now, if you don't understand the word vilifies, that, that just means it makes evil, makes, it makes something wrong of the present. It doesn't regard any truth or reason. But here's the interesting part, the first part of that sentence. Discontent magnifies what is past. Do you know that Egypt was a very spectacular place to live. Yes, they were slaves. Yes, they were slaves, but it was a spectacular place to live. Some, if you look up some artists' impressions, particularly the romantic artists, who painted pictures of what they uh, believe Egypt would have looked like. You know, in front of those three pyramids in Gaza, there would have been a city, and sisters, it would have been the most magnificent of architecture not plain buildings as we you know see them now but they would have been painted and full of color and you, you know we don't know how to build cities in this modern day I, I, <clears throat> you know in, incredibly ornate a statue or a relief sculpture or a sculpture on every corner nothing was ordinary every every gutter and rain shoot was was decorated and um, everything was enormous and done to such a scale that man would feel small in the sight of Pharaoh's kingdom. Isn't that what the devil does to us? Isn't that what our lives were? Do you know, last night we heard the testimony from young Tara Mackie in Scotland, and I 
just love that honesty of what she said about how much she loved that past life. Do you know, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the pleasures of sin, I resign. Make no mistake. You know, I, I think I've, we've spoken about this before, that somebody thought that that word pleasure was wrong and changed the words in that hymn and changed it to, for thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. But you know, when you're in Egypt, you don't think it's folly. When you're in that world, when you're in that past, you don't think that that's folly. You think that that's nice. You, you're enjoying it. And that's the power that the devil has. This is why those of you who are mummies, I want to urge you tonight. Do not lose the vision to get your children through to salvation from a very early age that Pharaoh might never get a hold of their hearts. You know, there's such a common, common fallacy, such a big mistake in this day and age that people want to give their children uh, the free choice. They want to just say, no, leave them, leave them go. Just let them choose for themselves. But their hearts have to hear the word of God. How can faith come without hearing the word of God? If you are not giving the gospel, preaching the gospel to your children, please do not hesitate. Do not stop. Do, do, not, do not continue like that. Make sure you're preaching the gospel, however all their hearts. Get them while they can, because the grip of Pharaoh only gets stronger. Egypt was a beautiful place to live. They may have been slaves, but you know, when they, they talk about what they missed, the leeks, the cucumbers, the garlics, the fish, the pomegranates, the figs, the sea, they had everything. It, Egypt was a prosperous, beautiful place. If we forget what God has done for us, how can we trust him to save our loved ones? You're going back to Tara last night. I want to say something to you because you might get the impression that she went to a four-day camp meeting with Brother Pendennon and on the third day she was saved and that was that. I, I need to tell you that she had an auntie who, was a, who is a believer and her cousin, of course, the very lady who was getting married, who prayed night and day, night and day, weeks and months and years for Tara. So here in that testimony, so beautiful last night, we see a young woman going to a convention and sitting there under the word of God. And by the third day, the spirit of God just so convicts her, the word of God, so come, do not harden your heart. That word just comes and it's quickened to her heart. But by the time that that word is quickened to her heart, there are days and weeks and months and years of prayer that have gone into Tara's cry for salvation. That auntie, that cousin, that, they're two ladies I know that were praying. And I know of their testimonies of praying for Tara. Yet there were probably others too, other members of the family who were saved. And I'm saying that tonight because it's so, I know every one of us has someone or many on our hearts that we're praying for. And I need you to be remember I need you to remember tonight. Do not give up praying. It can take just days like that with Tara, hardly under the word of God, hardly walked into a church before. All of her teenage life, I thought she encapsulated her teenage life in such a very, um, just, just a clear way we could see that she lived exactly how she wanted to live, taking whatever she wanted to take, doing whatever she wanted to do. And yet, it seems such a short period of time that she just walked into that camp meeting a few days before the wedding and then get saved. And there could be some of you sitting there going, well, how come that's not happening for my loved one? How come that's not happening for the people that I'm praying for? But you must remember and you must realize weeks and days and months of faithful prayer. Remember to pray. You know, I also want to emphasize that this salvation ground is absolutely level absolutely level the price to pay for my redemption the price to pay for my salvation is the same price for a prostitute or for a thief you and i there is no difference it took the precious blood of christ to save us it will take the precious blood of christ to save your loved ones it is no different 
remember that. Don't be overwhelmed. Or oh, this one or that one's done too much. Or maybe God won't take them. God, it is his desire and his will to save all. It is desire and his will to heal all, to deliver. There's no reason why Israel ought to have been walking in this wilderness. They put themselves there by their own disobedience, by their own hard hearts. Well, let's go to one other uh, scripture then in Numbers that, where something else happened. So in the previous scriptures in Numbers 13 and 14, we see that they saw those giants and they, they just couldn't cope with the thoughts of the future. We saw as well that only 45 days coming out of Egypt, after seeing Pharaoh drowned in that Red Sea and the whole army gone, <clears throat> they're already complaining to Moses and to Aaron. Well, here's another incident. In Numbers 20, we read there was no water. They got to the wells and there was no water. You know, we're not told there were no wells because there were wells. The wilderness areas always had wells. Sometimes there were groups of wells. Sometimes there were natural springs. But there were wells nevertheless. But when they got to some of these wells, or at crucial times they got to the well, and the well was dry. The wells were without water. And we read in Numbers chapter 20 that again they complained and they gathered themselves against Moses and against Aaron. And again, we read that Moses and Aaron interceded for the people. Do you know, there's somewhere else in the Bible, and it's toward the very end of the Bible, that we read about wells without water. And I want you to take heed to this, please, sisters. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, warning us about false prophets. It says, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring damnable heresies, denying that the Lord brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. In the same chapter, in verse 17, listen to this. These, talking about the false prophets, are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist is darkness reserved forever. Wells without water fell false prophets. So again, even though Numbers is an actual historic record and account of what happened to the people of Israel after they came out of Egypt, even though it's a historic account, it's also a shadow and a type of our own lives and a warning for us. It's there for our instruction. We have been warned about false prophets. There's a very strong warning that has risen up even during this period of time that we were living through now called lockdown. I was wondering if any one of the ladies who were in the Bible study up to the end of last summer or when we last had a, had a meeting, if you could remember what we were studying. And I might ask you to type if you can remember what, you, what we were studying. But I know that it's not fair on those who were not here or who are from another country. But I will remind you of this. Let's see if anybody's remembering what we were studying. I will remind you that I'd asked you to go back over a particular series that had been taught in the church, and I was asking you to go lesson by lesson, to listen to those lessons, and you were then coming back and we were talking about those individual lessons. Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember what the name of that series was? I'm going to put you out of your misery. How to judge biblically. How to judge biblically. It was such a burden of my heart that so many of you had not been in the church five to six years ago when that had been taught. And I felt that I couldn't teach it any better or that there was so much in those lessons. There were 18 of them and I know it was a lot. And you know, I was giving you those who were there every two weeks just to go through one lesson. 
Well, it's because I believe so firmly with all my heart that in that series on how to judge biblically are the tools and the armory to protect you from false prophets and false teachers, to protect you, sisters, from getting to a place where you find yourselves at a well with no water. Because that is what a false prophet is. It gives you a false hope. It gives you a false understanding. It has no foundation in the word of God. But can I say this now? When I talk about false prophets, I'm not talking about just maybe big names. I haven't been afraid to name Joyce Meyer in the past. I'm not afraid to name her. I'm not afraid to name uh, Paula White or, or other teachers like this who tragically mix truth with error. And you know, I hope you know by now, that if I put a little bit of animal dung into a bowl of ice cream, I'm not going to eat that bowl of ice cream. That's a horrible illustration. I, likewise, I can give you the illustration again. I'm not going to roast a chicken and put it down the toilet and then serve it to you on the table. No, that chicken is still a chicken, but it's been, it's been contaminated by, what, 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 by putting it down the toilet or by putting that little bit of false. I'm not scared to name those ones, but do you know, those aren't my biggest concern. It's always the subtle things. It could be maybe not a teacher, could even be a friend. Maybe you friend somebody on Facebook or maybe you join a group on Facebook and uh, you know it's, we can all join groups inadvertently not knowing what they believe or or, or, or what they what they are, are going to bring forth after a time but whatever you're listening to and whatever you're watching I ask you I beg of you judge it biblically because the Bible says she or he who is spiritual they who are spiritual judge all things that means we must line it up that means we must remember what the word of God says and line up whatever they're saying with the word of God. So again, I want to say this. The people of Israel found themselves at wells without water, but they never needed to have been there. You see, if they had even gone into the promised land when Moses saw that really it, it was time to go into the promised land, they wouldn't even have been in this position because of disobedience because fear, because they allowed those fears to rule them. They allowed fear to rule them instead of the faith in the word of God. Take care of wolves in sheep's clothing. Take care. I don't know another church that has been more clearly warned on where to listen for truth, how to listen for truth. Take that responsibility. I thought that was a very good message last night from our brother David, reminding us to take responsibility in this time, making sure that that tool bag is full. You know, just this week or in the last number of weeks, I've, I've, I've made contact with an old friend of mine. I've been very, very burdened for her for a number of weeks. And it's only just recently come to light then what she's actually started to believe. And, you know, I just wanted to give you one example of one sentence she said to me because this is the kind of subtlety that can come in through communication. We, we, we can communicate so easily with somebody across the world and something little that they can say can just tug at our foundations and test us. And this is one thing she said to me. She said, God can't be expressed in words. Words are too limiting for the essence of God. God said, I am, not I do. We've got to experience God. We've got to breathe him. We've got to feel God. And, you know, I'd like to think, that's the end of the quote, by the way, I would like to think that you've had enough of the word of God taught and that you're living enough of the word of God to know that this is very subtle, dangerous philosophy. It's the vain babblings of man. It is without foundation. It, in fact, is a well without water. To say that God can't be expressed in words, yes, great is the mystery of godliness, but you know what? He is the word of God. He is, I can know him. I want to know him, just like Paul writes in Philippians. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. We can know God. We can know his character. We are exhorted to know him. We are exhorted to remember 
his works. We are exhorted to remember what he did for Israel because what he did for Israel is no less than he'll do for us. It's no more than he'll do for us. He is without, he is without limit. God is infinite. But we do know who he is. We know his character. Every time I open the word of God, I know who he is. I have that assurance of a loving, merciful, long-suffering, kind, good God. It's subtleties like that, though, that can come in and they start to make us wonder. I wonder if I need to read the word of God or if I just need to feel him or experience him. There's a lot of worship out there, even music worship, that has a kind of a touchy-feely kind of, without that solid word. These are distractions. Do you know, in that second Peter scripture where it talks about the wells without water, the second part of that sentence is clouds that are carried with a tempest. I want you to picture that for a minute. A cloud. A cloud is something fluffy. It's white. It floats. A cloud is not grounded. A cloud is in the air. The total opposite of that cloud is a firm foundation. And you know what a firm foundation is? One of our great firm foundations is grace. Do you know that grace establishes and fixes our hearts? I hope that you know that one of the most important passages of scripture for us as women is in Titus chapter 2. And I cannot let a special ladies meeting go by without reading Titus chapter 2. And listen to this tonight. We're going to go a bit further than we would normally have gone. Titus chapter 2 and verse 1. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and in patience. That the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given too much wine. Teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And listen to this, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world and that phrase present world means in this age that we live in it's not just the environment but it's actually the age that we live in looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Let me say that little sentence again. Grace of God fixes and establishes our hearts. It teaches us, the grace of God will teach us to live soberly, to live righteously. We all know that famous hymn, Amazing Grace. Listen to this one verse. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. There's something very solid, foundational, that is the opposite of being a cloud in the air. Something so solid. Do you know that one sentence there says that Aged women likewise be in behavior as becometh holiness. Whatever you're studying or looking at, I would love to ask just one little side question here. Whatever you're involved with, is it making you more holy? Is it making you more humble? Is it making you more thankful? And is it making you more heavenly? These are the questions we should be asking ourselves. Otherwise, it's a distraction. Remember. Remember. What God has called us to. We're not called to be some idea or vain imagination of what man thinks a woman should be. This is solid. It's not a cloud. It's direct instruction. Remember, this is what the Word of God says a woman ought to be. 
that the young women should be sober, that they should love their husbands, that they should love their children, that they should be discreet, that they should be chaste, which means pure. They should be keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Remember, this is the word of God to us as women. Well, I'd like to look at another incident, if we have time, of how the Israelites behaved when they were out in that desert. This time, they were discouraged because of the way. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 4 and 5 says, They journeyed from Mount Hall by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And what that means is the journey was long. It was taking time. And I want to ask you tonight, sisters, whether it's training your children or loving your husband or working diligently in the job that you have or being long-suffering with family members or loving or even your own discipline in your walk with God. Is the length of time that things are taking is the way discouraging you? Because the next step after being discouraged was the people spoke against God. Do you know, in these other former scriptures that we've just studied, they were always just shy of accusing God, and they accused Moses and Aaron. And that's typical of the heart of man. But the first port of call is to always blame him or her. Just like the Garden of Eden, the oldest game in the world, the blame game. It's not my fault, it was him. Not my fault, it was her. And up to this point, we saw they blamed Moses, they blamed Aaron, they rose up against Moses, they rose up against Aaron. But here, they actually have the audacity to speak against God. And that is what happens in the heart of man. This is something very fearful to me because, sisters, I don't want you to one minute think that you or I are not capable of accusing God, of putting us in a position that we don't think we should be in. You know, we as women love to instruct. It's a God-given thing that we, inside almost all of us, I don't know, I'm not sure I've met a woman that doesn't enjoy some sort of giving of instruction or, or teaching. It's a God-given thing because you're called to be a nurturer, whether it's as an aunt or a grandmother or a mother. We're all called to give some sort of instruction. And the worst part is that we, we think we can give instruction to God. We think that we can somehow tell him that he's taking too long. And What's the result of that discouragement? Well, we know what happened then. We also know that when they complained of no meat, we know what happened then. God gave them so much quail that it was literally coming out of their noses. Psalm 106 is an amazing summary or a precy of the whole of this picture of the Israelites in Egypt. And I want to read just some of it because I believe in coming to the end of this message, it just summarizes for me the warnings of forgetting the goodness, the power, and the saving grace of God. Because if we forget that, how can we have hope for the future? I know that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead now dwells in me, dwells in you if you're born again this night. Listen to Psalm 106. Verse 7 says, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies. Let me read that little bit again. They remembered not the multitude of God's mercies. What a warning. But they provoked God at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea, it was dried up, and he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated him and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. They soon forget 
his works. Can I just say those last three little stanzas again, those little phrases again? Verse 12, then believed they his words. In other words, they believed him once they saw the miracle. We could almost put another then in. Then they sang his praise. Then they soon forgot his works. Don't be despising or don't be disparaging of Israel thinking, how could these people do that? That is what we do. That is what we do. When we undervalue the power of what God has already done in our lives. If you think it, it was nothing for God to save me, it was nothing for God to save a Neve or a Victoria or a Hannah or a Margaret or an Ellen or an Angie. If, if we think it was nothing, if we devalue that or undervalue it, how can you walk forward? If you forget his works, listen to what they carried on. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God, the God which had done great things in Egypt. Verse 43, many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel. That means their discussions. That means what they were talking about. And I do exhort you, ladies, take care what conversations you have. Take care with whom you're having conversations. Because, you know, it's so easy to have your faith undermined by the kind of company and counsel that you keep. And it says they were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this is who God is so merciful. He, he regarded their affliction and he heard their cry and he remembered for them his covenant. And here's the wonderful news tonight. We may forget, but God is a covenant keeping God. He remembered for them his covenant. God is so rich in mercy. And he repented according to the multitude of his mercies. And he made them also to be pitied of them that carried them captives. And the psalm ends off beautifully and says, Save us, O Lord, and gather us from among the heathen. To give thanks unto thy holy name. And to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. And I want to end just with one beautiful psalm which I think all of us should know. Psalm 20 and verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We will remember the name of the Lord our God. In that word remember is not just a knowing but it's an understanding. It's a knowing intimately. It's an experience that I've had where nobody can move that. I feel for me the day I got saved was like a day climbing Mount Everest. You can be sure that if I climbed Mount Everest, you would see my flag at the top of that mountain. I was not going to get all the way to the top of Mount Everest and not put a flag at the top. So those flags that our brother was talking about that are being cleaned up at the top of that mountain, you would have found my flag there. And that's what salvation was for me. It was the day that I met the man of Calvary. The day that I knew that my sin had held him there on that cross. A flag went in the ground and I was going, I'm not turning back. I'm not going back to that world. I remember, I know the name of the Lord our God. He has delivered me. If we had a piano tonight and we could sing, there is one song that I would be singing oh, most definitely. I have made you too small in my eyes. Oh God, forgive me. And the chorus says, be magnified, oh Lord. Be magnified, which means be made bigger. Don't let me see you just as the world sees you. Don't let me get this kind of vision that Israel got. Israel forget the works of God. They did not remember. All they could see was the giants of that future. What a godly calling we've been called to. And I exhort you all as ladies, take time to memorize, to get to know Titus chapter 2. And those scriptures in Timothy that we've also spoken about of 
what a woman should be. Don't forget what a woman should be. Don't forget that if he saved you from that past, he will give you the power to live out Titus chapter 2. He has given you the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, which will, who will enable you. The Holy Spirit is a person. He will enable you to live out those scriptures. So let's commit this word to the Lord. And if you have any questions after we've prayed, we're going to have a little discussion time. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just thank you for this word. Lord, we don't want to be women who forget what a mighty and great deliverance you have brought about. Lord, we lift up our loved ones to you tonight, the ones that we are praying for, for salvation. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that the same power that, that, that delivered me and my sisters from, this, from sin and self, that power is still available and is there for our loved ones. And we do lift them up to you tonight and ask, Father, deliver them. Father, we do ask you that we'd be faithful for the word and with the word that you've given us, Lord, that we'd be careful, that we would judge biblically, Lord, that we would take heed to all the things that we've been taught. And Lord, that we wouldn't be blown about like that cloud with diverse doctrines, Lord, but that we would be grounded and founded upon your word. Your word is truth and your word is Christ. We do thank you for our Savior tonight. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that has delivered us. Father, I'm asking you, Father, that we go on from here. Lord, that we go, Lord God, without fear into that promised land. Lord, that the giants, Lord God, that we would, Lord God, not see ourselves as grasshoppers, but see the giants as grasshoppers, Lord. And we do, Father, look forward to the coming and soon return of Christ. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen.